So we're going to be focusing on evidence of evolution and um, things that support the theory of evolution. Uh, so let's start first with uh, talking briefly about what a common ancestor is. Okay, so the theory of evolution states that we have a, that there is a common ancestor, that all forms of life can be traced back to this common ancestor. And one of the ways that we show these relationships is through either phylogenetic trees or cladograms. They're both diagrams that help show the relationships between the various species. Okay? Um, they're very similar looking diagrams. Your phylogenetic tree, as you can see, is usually um, a little more freeform looking. Okay? Your cladogram is usually very linear. And these are going to be based on, like I said, they're based on relationships, and you can see who is most closely related to the others and see where the common ancestry is. Like, for instance, if we look at this phylogenetic tree down here in this right-hand corner here, okay, um, you can see the time scale there. So the common ancestor to everybody would be down here at A. Okay, um, things that have not made it all the way up here to present times, okay, like H and C and D, all of these things are extinct okay, if they have not made it up to present day uh, time. So all of these organisms have become extinct. Okay, um, you can base relationships on the branching points. Like, for instance, you can say that the common ancestor for L and M the most recent common ancestor would be F, or the most recent common ancestor for J and K would be I. Okay. Or, for instance, a common ancestor of J and M, you'd have to come all the way back here to E. Okay. So you're just looking for your branching points there. The cladogram, like I said, is set up very similar. A uh, cladogram groups them into clades or um, kind of like families. Uh, you can see this cladogram on the top here. A, uh, so this shows that the bird and the horse are more closely related okay, because they branch off closer together. You would read the bottom one just like the phylogenetic tree next to it. So looking at the bottom one, A would be your common ancestor for everything. A, a common ancestor for E and F would be found right there. Um, B and C would be more closely related to one another than D because uh, B and C branch off closer together. Um, D, E, and F would all be extinct because they don't make it to present day. Okay, so you read both of the diagrams very similar to one another. Okay, so let's look at some pieces of evidence of evolution. Okay, so these are things that support the theory of evolution. So the first piece of evidence that we would have would be fossils. Okay, and so fossils are, um, for most people, it's one of the first things they think of when they think of evolution. And, you know, they think dinosaurs and bones and these fossils. Okay, and a fossil is just going to be, uh, fossils consist of remains or traces of the organism Okay, and so remains would be actual pieces of the organisms. Okay, so remains would be a piece of skin, um, something like this, the actual bones. Those would be remains, okay, actual pieces of the organism. Traces would be um, things that the organism left behind. Uh, for instance, um, footprints or burrows. Okay, those would be examples of trace. Both of those remains or traces can become fossils. Okay, um, so it's going to be your remains or traces of the organism that lived a long time ago. Uh, you know, your study of fossils is your paleontology. Remember, it's an ology, so that's a study of. So that's our study of our fossils. And most of our fossils are going to be found in this layered rock. Remember, your sedimentary rock. Okay, and the sedimentary rock or the layers here, this is what's going to, um, it helps to determine the age of the fossil. The further down in the layers that you find the fossil, the older it's going to be. Okay? The newer, more recent fossils would be near the top of the rock layer. The study of fossils allows for a variety of things. Okay? Um, it does allow for the study of the extinct organisms because you can find their remains or their traces, so you can study these organisms that no longer exist. So it does allow for that. Um, that was one of the ways that um, scientists were able to discover a link between uh, birds and dinosaurs, was by studying the structure and the fossils between the two. 
Okay. Um, you can see the phylogenic tree that's been created here on the left, okay, showing uh, modern birds and their relationship to the dinosaurs. Okay. Um, it's also able to show how life on Earth has changed because it gives us a link to these organisms that existed uh, previously. So it's been able to show a change of the life on Earth. It's also been able to show that there's an, been an increase in our life forms, a, um, so an increase in diversity, increase in the amount of life forms that exist on Earth. A, um, the fossil record, though, however, does have a flaw, okay, and that would be that it's incomplete. Okay, we definitely do not have fossils of every single organism that has ever existed. Okay, um, we are not um, unable to find them all. They may not have um, been fossilized. Okay, so the fossil record is incomplete. There are gaps within the fossil record. So it is not necessarily our best piece of evidence uh, in the support of evolution because of the gaps. Some more evidence that we have for the theory of evolution is our comparative anatomy. Okay, and so with our comparative anatomy, we're looking for what are called homologies, okay, um, homologous structures. Remember, homo means man or the same. So these are structures that are going to be very similar. And we may find these embryologically. Okay, uh, we may find them in the actual anatomical structure. We may be looking for homologies in the DNA sequence of things that are um, very similar that help show ancestry. Uh, so we're going to look at the comparative anatomy part first. So we're going to first look at uh, what are called homologous structures. And a homologous structure is one that has the same um, or very, very similar structure, but a different function. Okay? And so that means they were built the same, okay? but they're used for different purposes. So they have very similar structure, different function. Okay, the diagram that you see over here shows you uh, examples of this, uh, what's called the pendactyl limb. Okay, and the pendactyl limb here, you've got a bat, a dolphin, an anteater, a mole, a horse, a pig, and a monkey. Humans um, would have examples of this as well, our arms and legs. And you can see the human example right there in the middle. Okay, all of these have the same basic structure. The one larger bone, okay, uh, the two bones, and then the set of smaller bones, and then the uh, ones that form the digits. Okay? And you can see that in each one of uh, these particular organisms. And now they'll look slightly different, okay? but they have that same basic structure, but they definitely have different functions. Okay? The bat uses it for flying, the dolphin for swimming, other organisms for running or walking, while some are using them for digging and grasping. Okay, so they have similar structures, but they have different functions. And what this does is this is going to show evidence of common ancestry. And it's going to show evidence of common ancestry because to be built with this similar structure, they have to have similar DNA. Remember, everything is coded for in our DNA. So if we have similar structures, then that means we had to have had similar instructions to get those. Okay? And so it shows that common ancestry. In addition to the common ancestry, they also, it also shows support for natural selection. These organisms were very similar in structure, but they have adapted for various functions. You've got a bird wing here. A, again, this is another fin or a flipper. A, um, very different functions based on environmental pressures a, that has caused the population as a whole of the organisms to adapt to their particular environment. So that would be your homologous structure. It is important that we do not confuse homologous structures with what's called an analogous structure. A, an analogous structure does not, um, these have do not have the same structure. Analogous structures have the same function, but they have a different structure or a different build to them. Okay? So these are different than homologous structures. And because they do not have the same structure, they do not necessarily show um, evidence of ancestry because their structures are different. Uh, the example we have here, we've got wings. A, that are used for the same thing, so they have the same function, a, uh, the bird flying and the insect flying, but these are analogous structures. Their structure build is very different. So they had similar environmental pressures that caused them to, to be able to fly, that flying would be beneficial for them, 
Okay, um, but they did not come from the same structure. So homologous structures, same structure, different function. Analogous structures, same function, different structure. Another uh, piece of comparative anatomy that we can use to support the theory of evolution is what are called Hox genes. Okay, Hox genes are genes that are similar in all animals. And these usually code for body position. And what I mean by body position are things like the eyes go on the front, you know, near the head. And the, um, the position of the abdomen is going to be in the middle. Okay? These are very, like I said, these are similar in all animals. It's the basic blueprint for the animal body. Okay? So again, that's why we see... Um, that's why we see eyes on the head. That's why we see fingers on the ends of the limbs. And that is the same in all organisms. Okay? Um, for instance, the head is on one end. You know, the head is not in the middle. Okay? Um, and so those Hox genes code for that. And they're very similar in all animals. So again, showing a link back to a common ancestor. Another example of a homology would be our embryology. Okay, uh, embryology is the study of embryos. And one of the things that we can see when looking at embryos is that um, different species may appear very, very similar in their early stages. Again, which is another example of a homology. If you look at these on the right here, all four of these are different organisms. They're all different vertebrates, so they're all different organisms that will have a backbone but they look very similar in their early embryological stages, which again shows a link to a common ancestor. Okay? If you look at them as they are further developed now, you can see that they are going to end up being very, very different organisms. Okay? Um, we've got a fish, one, a tadpole, a turtle, and then a pig. So very, very different organisms. Again, showing a link back to a common ancestor. If the embryos are similar, then it shows the link that the um, DNA has got to be similar. If you look at uh, this example here, okay, you can see this one includes a human. Okay, this one on the end here is the human embryo, okay, and it looks very similar in those first, um, in those early stages to the hog, the calf, and the rabbit embryo. Another anatomical uh, support that we have for evolution is what's called the vestigial structure. And the vestigial structure is very decreased in size, okay, so it is um, shrunken in size, and they are non-functioning, okay, and they're remnants of structures that do work in other organisms. So like I said, these are very sh shrunken in size, small in size, non-functioning remnants of a similar organism in another species. Um, examples of things like this would be the human tailbone, okay, the uh, pelvis bones of both a whale and a snake, the pelvis is used to support weight when you walk upright. Okay? And so the evidence of a um, shrunk, this example here is the whale pelvis, um, shrunken in size, a, a remnant of a structure that is no longer functioning and no longer needed because the whale lives in water, same as the snake. Okay? But it tells us that they used to walk, up, um, they used to walk and bear weight. And so that they needed those pelvic bones. And so again, it shows a link to common ancestry. It shows our evolutionary past and a link to these organisms that have similar structures that still function. Another piece of evidence would be, and this is probably our most significant, is our amino acid sequencing. Okay? It's another example of homologies, okay? so things that are very similar. And so our amino acid sequencing shows similar DNA, being able to code for the same amino acid sequence. For instance, let's look at the top diagram up here with this um, DNA base uh, comparison. Okay, you'll see that there are similarities between all three of them. Okay, and then there are similarities between the uh, that are just between the gorilla and the chimpanzee. And then there are similarities that are between the chimpanzee and the human. Okay, so 
there is a lot of things that are very similar okay, in these DNA sequences. Okay? And so again, it's going to show our link to a common ancestor. The more amino acids they have in common, the more closely related they are. And remember, amino acids are coded from the DNA. Remember, we take our DNA, transcribe it into RNA, and then we take that RNA and read our chart to find our amino acids. For instance, let's look at the um, bottom diagram down here. Okay, and we're looking at this protein. So here's our protein, cytochrome C. And remember, our proteins are made up of bunches of amino acids. And we're looking at the comparison. Okay, and if we're looking at our comparisons here, we see that um, it's the same, same, same. Okay, and then we finally get a difference here between these two guys. Okay, and then the fruit fly and the screwworm fly, they stay the same. Okay, they stay the same all the way down to these last two. Okay, and so what we're looking for, like I said, are these similarities. The more that they have in common, the more closely related they are. Like I said, this is probably our strongest evidence for relationships. Again, it's another example of homology. We're seeing this similar DNA being able to code for similar amino acid sequences. Okay, keep in mind, remember, we have what is called a universal genetic code. Okay, and our universal genetic code states that these uh, DNA triplets, these codons, are going to be similar in all organisms. Remember, if I have, um, let's say I have AGG up here in the human, and that codes for the amino acid, I'm making this up, that codes for the amino acid serine. Well, then in a chimpanzee, it codes for serine, and in a gorilla, it codes for serine. Okay, so that's our universal genetic code, that these DNA triplets, they're going to code for the same amino acid. They mean the same thing in every single organism. Now, it doesn't mean those amino acids are in the same order, but it means the little groups of three are going to read the same on the chart, no matter what organism you're looking at, which again shows a link back to a common ancestor. Okay, we have two more pieces of evidence left, the biogeography and what's called observable events. So biogeography is just our distribution of species around the earth. Okay, so our bio, our life, okay, and our geography, where things are. So our di distribution of species, like I said, across the earth. And so when we look at our biogeography, um, it helps support, it supports the evidence of a Pangea. Okay, if you look here, you can see that you have fossil remains on both South America and Africa, okay, showing that they had that they were at one point in time linked together. Okay, um, we also get what are called our uh, zoogeographic regions. In these regions, uh, these are large areas that are going to be separated by uh, big geographic boundaries, uh, things like mountains um, or oceans, okay? and so that's going to isolate a species, and they're going to become adapted to their particular region, and so you'll see different kinds of species based upon their particular region. But our biogeography, like I said, lends uh, credence to the Pangaea okay? and to the fact that um, these organisms used to be in the same location. The last piece of evidence we have is the what are called observable events. These would be things like the finches, uh, the peppered moth. You're not going to be able to see these in every single kind of organism. Uh, but these are things that basically you, you can see the evolution happening. You can see the population changing. So these are going to need to be organisms that reproduce relatively quickly. Okay? They're um, either completely isolated or there have been some major kind of environmental change for them. Um, but it shows that evolution is an ongoing process, that it's still occurring, that populations are still changing, their genetic makeup is still changing, and so their allele frequencies are changing, and so the evolution is a constantly happening thing. Okay, so we'll be working with these pieces of evidence uh, in class so that we can uh, get a little bit more comfortable with them.